Okay, you can turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Exodus 4, I'll begin reading in verse 1. Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, Now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, Put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom, and behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river and pour it on the dry land. The water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. And Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. But he said, O oh my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people. And he himself shall be as a mouth for you. And you shall be to him as God. And you shall take this rod in your hand with which you shall do, do the signs. So Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go, return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. Then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. And the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him on the mountain of God and kissed him. So Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then he did the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked on their affliction, then they bowed their heads in worship. Amen. Well, thus far in our studies in Exodus in chapter 1, we meet immediately with the oppressor of God's people. It is Egypt, and it is the Pharaoh leading Egypt. In chapter 2, we have the birth of Moses, who will function as the deliverer, the human agency by which Egypt, uh, Israel will be delivered out of Egypt. And then in chapter 3, you have a call, a call narrative or a commission. God appears to Moses and calls him into service as the deliverer to lead his people out of Egypt. Now, cha chapter 4 continues that up until verse uh, 17. 
So chapter 4, verses 1 to 17, continue that call narrative, and then 18 and following, goes to uh, uh, Moses goes back to Egypt. So he's about 80 years old at this particular time. He was 40 when he killed the Egyptian and left to go to Midian. He has spent 40 years in Midian, and now he's back to engage with Pharaoh and to engage in the task of leading Israel out of that bondage. So we'll look first at the reluctance of Moses regarding the commission. It's essentially what we find in this first section in chapter 4, verses 1 to 17. So chapter 3, God calls him to service. He expresses a bit of uh, reluctance in verse 11 in chapter 3. Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Well, that sort of reluctance continues in verses 1 to 17. So we'll look at the reluctance of Moses regarding the commission, and then secondly, the return of Moses to Egypt in verses 18 to 31. But in the first place, note the signs given to confirm Moses in verses 1 to 9. Moses asks the question of God. Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. That's a good question. It doesn't evidence a lack of faith on Moses' part for God, but I think it uh, indicates a suspicion in the heart of Moses concerning the faith of Israel toward God. Already we've seen where Israelites had sort of rebuffed Moses for his action in killing that Egyptian. That was one of the reasons why he fled into the land of Midian. So this question isn't expressing doubt in Yahweh. Rather, he's expressing concern for Israel that they may not be convinced that he is, in fact, the deliverer of God's people. And in light of that, God tells him to engage in the first sign. So verses 2 to 5. He tells him to take up his rod. It's a rod, a shepherd's rod, that Moses would utilize as he was shepherding the, the, the animals that belonged to Jethro and his family. And then God tells him to cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, according to verse 3, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. Now this is obviously a very powerful display on the part of the living God, able to change a rod into a snake and change the snake back into a rod. Robert Alter said, the shepherd's staff is his familiar possession and constant practical tool. Its sudden metamorphosis into a reptile is thus a dramatic demonstration to Moses of God's power to intervene in the order of nature that will be repeatedly manifested in the plague narrative. Remember, this is fitting and consistent because it is precisely over the forces of nature that Yahweh will operate when he brings those plagues to bear upon Egypt. And then with reference to his command to pick it up, notice what he says in verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. I'm not a handler of snakes, but the last thing I would ever do would be to grab a snake by the tail. Even a rube like me knows you grab it by the neck so that it can't bite you. And I think that this manifests or evidences the danger involved and the trust expressed by Moses to do that very thing. So God calls upon him to, to pick up this snake by the tail. And again, Robert Alter says this, the tail is the most dangerous place to seize a venomous snake and thus requires Moses to trust implicitly that God will keep him from harm. So notice the goodness of our God in this particular instance. Moses expresses concern in verse 1 that the people may not believe that Yahweh had appeared to Moses. So God doesn't say to Moses, you just get in there and do exactly what you're told. No, God accommodates himself to Moses and gives him a series of signs, miraculous signs, that Moses can engage in with the children of Israel to confirm and authenticate that he is in fact God's man, that he is in fact God's representative. If you've paid attention to preaching through the book of Acts, you'll know that that's often the thing that I say with reference to signs and wonders. It's not to dazzle the audience. It is rather to confirm the, 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 the person that they are spokesmen for God. So miracles come at the time of Moses. Miracles come at the time of the prophets. Miracles come at the time of Jesus and his apostles. And in each of those instances, those miracles confirm that the men speaking were in fact speaking the word of the living God. Miracles are not an end of themselves. Rather, they help or affirm or confirm or authenticate the speaker that he is in fact from God Almighty. And so with reference to this first sign, this casting of the rod on the, on the ground, it becoming a snake and then the, rod, uh, the snake turning back into the rod, notice what God says in terms of the purpose. Verse 5, 
that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Abraham, or, uh, God of Jacob, rather, has appeared to you. So again, it's to confirm the reality that Moses speaks on behalf of God. The Geneva Bible says this power to work miracles was to confirm his doctrine and to assure him of his vocation. So it affirms the doctrine of the men that are speaking. And again, it's not like the Charismatics or the Pentecostals that see these miracles or these signs as the end in, in and of themselves. They are a vehicle, they are an instrument, they are a help to affirm the reality that the speaker is speaking on behalf of God. Mark 16, 20 says, And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. If you keep that in your mind, I think that's a helpful way to approach biblical prophecy, uh, 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 not biblical prophecy rather, but the, the signs and the wonders associated with those instances where God is giving revelation. Now after this, there is a second sign, and this one concerns the reality that God has the power to both create and as well to heal disease. So he tells Moses to put his hand into his bosom and to take it out again and it will have leprosy. Now the word leprosy in our English Bible probably covers various skin diseases. Leprosy is literally Hansen's disease, and there are times or instances in Scripture where what is being described is probably not Hansen's disease. So look at leprosy as sort of a catch-all for those things that affect the skin. Certainly that was a part of it, Hansen's disease, but there are other skin diseases involved in the Bible. So the Lord has the power to create disease, and the Lord has the power to heal disease. Now, this will be helpful not only con to confirm the signs with reference to Moses and his ability to speak for God, but as well with reference to the, to the conquest of Canaan itself. If you turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 7, this would be very encouraging news to the children of Israel who are living in a land essentially of disease. Deuteronomy 7, after giving the, the stipulation concerning holy war, in 7.12, we see, Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments, and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain and your new wine and your, your oil, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock, in the land of which he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There shall not be a male or female barren among you or among your livestock. And the Lord will take away from you all sickness and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt which you have known, but will lay them on all those who hate you. Also you shall destroy all the peoples whom the Lord your God delivers over to you. Your eyes shall have no pity on them, nor shall you serve their gods, for that will be a snare to you. So a, a blessing for obedience would be the absence of those diseases that they had contracted frequently in the land of Egypt. But on the other hand, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28 contains an extended or an, an extended treatment or amplification of cursings and blessings. Blessings if they're obedient in the land, cursings if they are not obedient in the land. Deuteronomy 28, specifically at verse 27, says, The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt, with tumors, with the scab, and with the itch from which you cannot be healed. The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of heart. And you, will sh and you shall grope at noonday as a blind man gropes in darkness. You shall not prosper in your ways. You shall be only oppressed and plundered continually, and no one shall save you. And then in verse 60, Moreover, he will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt, of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. So remember, the children of Israel knew God. They had probably fallen into tough times in terms of their knowledge of him, however, so this is a learning experience concerning the God of Israel. So he is sovereign over nature. He is sovereign over disease. He is sovereign over life and death itself. And this will serve as a comfort to Moses. It will serve as an encouragement to the children of Israel and should hopefully horrify the people of Egypt. If it doesn't, when they hear about it, it certainly will obtain when they're burying their firstborn. You'll see that that's in this chapter way before it ever transpires. So the second sign, the Lord has power to create disease, the Lord has power to heal disease. And then there's a third sign indicated in verses 8 and 9. 
than it will be if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river and pour it on the dry land. The water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. So again, God bears long with his people. I mean, it should be no sign. Believe the word of the living God. That's not the reality, though, and God knows that. So God gives us graciously these various signs to affirm Moses' call and as well to aid the people of Israel. Now, this third sign isn't engaged, and it actually becomes the first plague in a direct assault upon the God of the Nile. Remember that when God brings these plagues to bear upon the children or upon the Egyptians, it is also a judgment against the gods of Egypt. Exodus 12 tells us that. They had a multiplicity of gods, and the Nile was certainly one of them. And so when God attacks the Nile, it sends quite the message to Egypt in terms of one of their deities. So those are the signs given to confirm Moses in 1 to 9. But then notice the additional remedies to assist Moses in verses 10 to 17. So Moses here expresses, again, two more aspects of his reluctance. In the first place, he says, I'm not eloquent. And in the second place, he says, there's got to be somebody else you can send. So Moses himself is struggling in terms of this call. And if we think about it, it's pretty obvious, just like when he throws the rod down and it turns into a snake. What does Moses do? He runs from it. What would you do? You'd run from it. If you were called to deliver Israel out of Egyptian bondage, there might be a reluctance in your heart as well. So let's not uh, run to swift judgment against Moses. We may think, wow, God is being very gracious to you, Moses. You need to step up and do what you're called to do. But he expresses this reluctance. And again, we see the kindness and the goodness of God in dealing with him. So notice in verses 10 to 12, it is this lack of eloquence. Now, verse 10, some have suspected that the text demands that we see some sort of an inability in Moses. Perhaps he stuttered. Perhaps he stammered. Perhaps he had some physical abnormality in which he couldn't speak. Nowhere else do we find that in Scripture. And very often, when men are called to service uh, uh, to God's service, they'll make a statement like this, like Saul, for instance. He came from less than noble origin. Or Gideon, that was another sort of a response. Why would, you, why would you choose me? So I don't think Moses is saying, I can't do it, I have an inability, or I have a stammering or a stuttering problem. I don't think that's it at all. Again, I think he's expressing his reluctance for the task. He's probably not as good a speaker as he'd like to be, and probably not as good a speaker as he would hope to be, given the nature of the task that he is involved in. He's got to stand before Pharaoh, he's got to lead a, a, a great horde of people, and he's got to engage with his mouth. And so perhaps this is, again, not an indication that he can't, it's an indication that he can't do it that well. And so Moses says in verse 10, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Now notice the response of the Lord in verse 11. So the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth, or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? So what is God's comfort to Moses? God's comfort to Moses is, I'm sovereign. I'm over your mouth. I'm over the ear. I'm over the tongue. I've made all these things. And therefore, if I have called you into my service, I am quite competent and capable to use what you have in order to accomplish the task. It's not the case that God is looking for the most gifted, and that's the one he seizes upon, and that's the one he'll use. No, he chooses according to his good pleasure, and because God is sovereign, he's able to take a man who perhaps doesn't have great facility and great competence in speaking, and nevertheless use him in a great way to speak. Re uh, remember the Apostle Paul. In fact, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 for just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul peels back, as it were, his own sort of uh, 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 psyche and shows us something about when he came to Corinth. This is a, uh, fitting and appropriate because this is the section we're in in the book of Acts, the third missionary journey. It's likely he wrote 1 Corinthians, 1 and 2 Corinthians during that missionary journey. And then he spends a, a substantial amount of time in Corinth in that second, second missionary journey. 
But in chapter 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So again, God isn't looking for the most gifted, skilled, and competent, because when he does that, the most gifted, skilled, and competent will be recognized as the most gifted, skilled, and competent. The reality is, is that he uses a Moses or that he uses the Apostle Paul such that when Moses and Paul do what it is that God called them to do, the glory goes to God, not to those men, and that's precisely what he says. But in, a, de, uh, in demonstration of the spirit and the power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. No one could say, wow, because of the speaking of Paul, I'm going to go to heaven. Or no one could say, oh, because of the savvy of Moses, we're going to leave Egypt. No, it's the glory of God. These are the human instruments of the agents that God uses. So he's not looking for the best and brightest necessarily. He's looking for obedient servants that will step up or pony up and do what he calls them to do with the ability to equip them for the particular task at hand. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, another sort of illustration of this particular point. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 5, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Again, it couldn't be the case that somebody says, well, I owe my salvation to the Apostle Paul. No, I owe my salvation to the grace of God. I owe my deliverance from Egypt to Moses, that great leader that's so wonderful in speech. No, we owe our deliverance to God Almighty. Commenting on this section in Exodus 4, Matthew Poole says, but indeed, he was therefore fit for it because he was a servant of a sovereign God. Therefore, or he was therefore fit for it as the unlearned apostles were for preaching of the gospel, that the honor of their glorious works might be entirely given to God and not to the instruments which he used. So that's a great emphasis, and I think it's very well illustrated here. So after having asserted his sovereignty over Moses and the reality that it's God that ultimately controls the tongue, the mouth, the ear, he says in verse 12, now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. So in other words, you don't need to worry about it when God is on your side. You don't need to worry about how you're going to do the job if the Lord has called you to do the job. He is certainly going to equip you for it. So that's the first or additional, uh, uh, another sign of his reluctance is this lack of eloquence. But then notice in verses 13 to 17, this is his sort of last ditch attempt. This is the last straw for Moses. He's going to try one more time. <clears throat> Verse 13, but he said, Oh my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. <clears throat> so it's as if he says, I think there's a book title by this, uh, by this uh, name. It says, Here am I, send Aaron. And I think that's probably what's in view in this particular instance. He doesn't name Aaron to be sure, but the idea is to send someone else. I'm not up to the task. So on the one hand, we might think, wow, he's reluctant, he's disobedient. No, I think on the other hand, he is reluctant because it is a daunting task. It is a massive task. It is a huge task. And he already has had sort of bad experience in, it, or in Egypt the time before when he killed that Egyptian. The next day he goes to break, out, uh, break up the fight between the Israelites. And the one Israelite says, you're going to kill me like you did with that Egyptian. Uh, Pharaoh gets wind of that. He has to run or flee and go to Midian. So he's had experience this way. So verse 13, he says, here am I, send Aaron. And we have the anger of the Lord kindled against him in verse 14a. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, so God is long-suffering, God is gracious, God is patient, and God nevertheless has this anger kindled to him, but still responds favor uh, favorably or positively to Moses. This is an amazing sort of expression of God's grace. 
Sometimes you'll meet people, or perhaps you don't always, it depends on the people that you meet, that have this conception of the God of the Old Testament, this warring, blood-shedding, wrathful, furious Lord that send the Israelites on these genocidal campaigns to go and to eliminate all the various ites in the land of Canaan. Look at the grace manifested by our God. Look at the long-suffering manifested by our God. If you or I were God, Moses started to get lippy with us, we'd probably just say, go do your job. Don't question the authority here. Don't, don't raise your you know, reluctance with me. I've given you a task, now go. But God doesn't do that. Sure, his anger is kindled against him, but he nevertheless undertakes on his behalf. So notice the grace of the Lord is seen in his answer to send Aaron along with Moses in verses 14b and 15. Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now the reality that he would be glad in his heart, I think indicates that for that 40 years before Moses fled to the land of Midian, but for that first 40 years of his life, when he lived in Egypt, he probably maintained some clandestine uh, contact with his family. There is that reality that him and Mos uh, Aaron and Moses know each other. And so when Aaron is called into service, he's going to be glad in his heart when after 40 long years, his baby brother Moses comes back from Midian into the land of Egypt in order to engage in this task of leading the people of Israel out, out of the, the bondage they're in in Egypt. So Aaron is the choice. Aaron is the man that is going to serve as assistant to Moses. And in verse 15, God says, Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. That doesn't mean he'll worship you. It doesn't mean you'll be deity. It doesn't mean he will bow down to you. But Aaron's function will be as the prophet, and Moses' function will be as God. Again, not Yahweh over Israel, but God speaks through Moses, and Moses then communicates that to Aaron, and then in turn to the children of Israel. I think Gill's comment is helpful here. He says, Aaron was to stand between Moses and the people and speak for him. And Moses was to stand between God and Aaron and in God's stead and tell him what orders he had received from him and which he should communicate. So again, you shall be as God to him. Doesn't mean deity or idolatry or anything like that. It's authority. God chose Moses as the sort of authoritative figure to lead the people out. Uh, Aaron would be his assistant or prophetic mouthpiece to communicate those things to the children of Israel. But along the way, we'll see that Moses communicates to the children of Israel also. And then verse 17 is a wonderful summary statement. And you shall take this rod in your hand with which you shall do the sign. Sort of ties up the entirety of the chapter. So you have these signs given to confirm Moses and then these additional remedies to assist Moses. God's sovereignty to deal with his problem of speech and then God's blessing in providing Aaron as an assistant to Moses to carry out this task. The signs will aid Israel. The sovereignty of God over Moses' mouth will aid Moses. And the addition of Aaron will aid Moses to carry out the commission for God and for Israel. So the call narrative is officially ended at this point. So chapters 3 and 4 are a unit. Moses wandering around the, 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 the plains there of Horeb or uh, the base of Horeb. He comes to this burning bush and God communicates these things to him. Now that brings us to the return of Moses to Egypt in verses 18 to 31. Notice in the first place, the return to Egypt. Verses 18 to 20. Just because you receive a divine call from the Lord and a commission to deliver his people from Egyptian bondage doesn't mean you should be discourteous or unkind to your relations. Notice in verse 18. So Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. So Moses doesn't go in there, guns blazing, Yahweh's called me into service, off I go. No, he shows courtesy, he shows kindness, he shows love and respect to Jethro, his father-in-law. Jethro, his father-in-law, has been very good to him. We'll meet Jethro again later on in the narrative around chapter 18. 
And then we have this assurance given by God in verse 19 that it's safe for Moses to return back to Egypt. If you go back to chapter 2 for a moment, you'll see why it was he left in the first place. Chapter 2, verse 11. Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way, and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid, hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, why are you striking your companion? Then he said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. You could see a bit of reluctance, physically speaking, logistically, uh, logistically speaking, on the part of Moses. So this is a great word of assurance. Moses is resigned to go. This is just gravy on top of all the benefit that God has given him. God didn't need to give him this assurance. He's already asked his permission from Jethro to go. He's going on the task dutifully and obedient to, uh, obedient to, uh, obediently to the Lord. But notice that God says in verse 19, Go, return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. Then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God in his hand. It's the rod of God there. It's identified as the rod of God, not because it belongs to God and not because it was given to him by God, but it's that tool, that symbol, that, that token, that emblem of the authority of God in, in, invested in Moses at this particular time. And then with reference to the sons, the sons are Gershom, we saw him in 2.22, and Eliezer will be mentioned in chapter 18 at verse 4. Now note the command of God with reference to his interaction with Pharaoh. So we're getting closer and closer to this meeting with Pharaoh. And again, if you consider the particular situation facing Moses, he's going to have to stand before a pagan king who has quite liked the reality that he has a a slave force, and then Moses is going to come and say, you're going to have to let them go. Pharaoh's not going to like this. He's not going to be thrilled with this, and we'll notice that as we move through that particular aspect of the narrative. But it will require some guts, it will require courage, and it will certainly require a particular message, and it's God's message that Moses is to bring to Pharaoh. So notice in the first place the wonders that will be done before Pharaoh. Verse 21, the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. And then notice this, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. This is a concrete expression of God's purpose in, in dealing with Pharaoh. If you go back to chapter 3 at verse 19, he says, but I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not even by a mighty hand. Verse 20, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst, and after that he will let you go. So with reference to the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, we have several instances in the narrative where it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Again, this will probably not cause Moses to cry and whine and want to be an Arminian. This will comfort and encourage Moses because ultimately, so, uh, God's sovereignty includes Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. As well, there are several instances along the way where Pharaoh hardens his heart as well. Now, when we ask the question, who does it first? Well, the fact that God announces it indicates that it's God doing it. But remember, Pharaoh's not innocent. He's not what's called a tabula rasa, which means a blank, blank slate. He's a sinner who has prospered and profited from the slave labor of Israel. He is a wretched man, and what God does in terms of hardening his heart is not an act of injustice, but just the opposite. It is an act of justice. In Romans chapter 1, when God gives them over to a reprobate mind, hopefully no Bible-believing Christian says, wow, that doesn't seem fair. But hopefully, every, I'm sure actually some of them do, but most Bible-believing Christians should say, that's an act of justice, divine justice. Why is he giving them over? Because they act like this. 
Or consider Jesus in Matthew 11, 25 to 30. I thank thee, uh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for thou didst hide these things from the wise and prudent, but thou, uh, thou didst reveal them unto babes. For even so it was well-pleasing in your sight. He hid these things from the wise and prudent. Again, you can hear people crying, oh, that doesn't seem fair. It's an act of justice to hide from people that are wicked the things that may save them. It's an act of justice, and we need to get our minds wrapped around that. So we have this expressed purpose of God in 3.20. I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst, and after that, he will let you go. And then over in chapter 12, you can turn there just to see the purpose of God in the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Exodus 12, 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and, ex and against all the gods of Egypt, Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And then Paul shines light on this judicial hardening of Pharaoh in Romans chapter 9. In Romans 9, 14, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, and this is a quote from Exodus 9.16, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. That's the reality of a sovereign God. We go back to Exodus chapter uh, 4, and I want to quote at length John Calvin, because there are commentators that indicate that the hardening of the heart was nothing other than God's permission. God just permitting Pharaoh to do that which Pharaoh wanted to do. Now certainly Pharaoh did do that which he wanted to do, but the language is not passive. It's not simply permission, but rather it's active. God says, I will harden his heart. And I thought Calvin's comment here was extremely helpful. He says, since the expression seems harsh to delicate ears, many soften it away by turning the act into mere permission, as if there were no difference between doing and permitting to be done or as if God would commend his passivity and not rather his power. As to myself, I am certainly not ashamed of speaking as the Holy Spirit speaks, nor do I hesitate to believe what so often occurs in Scripture, that God gives the wicked over to a reprobate mind, gives them up to vile affections, blinds their minds, and hardens their hearts. But they object that in this way God would be made the author of sin, which would be a detestable impiety. I reply that God is very far from the reach of blame when he is said to exercise his judgments. Wherefore, if blindness be a judgment of God, it ought not to be brought in accusation against him that he inflicts punishment. But if the cause be, be often concealed from us, we should remember that God's judgments are not without reason called a great deep. And therefore, let us regard them with admiration and not with railing. I think that is very appropriate, and I think that is most excellent, and that's the way we approach the living and true God. We are not called to defend God in the way of trying to explain away his sovereign dealings with this wretch Pharaoh. Again, he's not dealing with an innocent specimen of a human being, and he just hardens his heart. This man was committed as an enemy against God, the God of Israel, and against his people. So this is an act of justice. And I suspect that this would indeed provide great comfort to Moses. Not that Moses would say, oh great, God's going to harden his heart, my mission will certainly fail. No, he'd say, oh great, God is sovereign even over this, so that what I undertake, I'm not engaged all alone, but the Lord Most High is over it all. And then notice the identification of Israel as firstborn in verses 22 and 23. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Now the nation of Israel was not the first nation, but they were, however, the preeminent nation. So that's what firstborn means. It certainly means firstborn in the sense that 
a baby comes out of the womb ahead of others. But with reference to theological, uh, some theological context, firstborn simply means preeminent. In Ezekiel 16.3, which Ezekiel 16, if you're not familiar with that passage, it's really one to be familiar with. It's basically the history of Israel or God's dealings with the, his, uh, the nation of Israel and how he found them and how he blessed them and how they went a-whoring from him and how he would bring judgment upon them and yet nevertheless he would bring blessing to bear upon them. But in Ezekiel 16.3, as God rehearses what happened when he found Israel, he says, your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. So firstborn here doesn't mean the first one ever, but it means preeminent. Remember the two sons of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim. Ephraim was the second born in terms of physical birth. In Jeremiah 31, 9, he's called the firstborn. Ephraim was better than or high, more highly regarded than was Manasseh. David was not the first king in Israel. Saul was. And yet David in Psalm 89 is called the firstborn. Jesus was not the first one raised from the dead, but in some resurrection context, he's referred to as the firstborn. So in Romans 8, 29, Jesus is called firstborn. Colossians 1, 15 and 18, firstborn. Hebrews 1, 6 and uh, an allusion in 12, 23, and then Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Now Jehovah's Witnesses will famously explain Colossians 1 by saying firstborn means that he's a creature. He was created by God. That is absolutely positively not at all what it means. Just like Israel wasn't the first nation on earth, but was in fact God's firstborn, the preeminent one, the one entitled to the privilege, and the one entitled to the blessing. So the nation of Israel is identified as the firstborn, and then note the threat of God with reference to Pharaoh if he should harm God's firstborn. Verse 23, so I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Just like if somebody were to threaten your child, what would you do? Oh, that's okay. That's wonderful. No, you'd want to threaten them back or promise them rather that if they go down that very unfortunate path, you will be at the end of it to do great harm to them. And that is precisely what Yahweh says. Robert Alter says, framing the relationship in these terms lays the ground in measure for measure justice for the lethal 10th plague predicted at the end of the next verse, since Pharaoh has sought to destroy Israel. Talking about this verse. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Now, on the way to Egypt, we meet with this interesting situation in verses 24 to 26. Probably all of you are wondering about that section you're going to continue to wander on because it's a tough section. And the connection seems to be difficult, but I think the connection hinges upon firstborn. It's probably Gershom that either wasn't circumcised as were the Israelites or wasn't circumcised at all. I think that's what's the connection in terms of firstborn with reference to God's identification of Egypt and uh, uh, re uh, or Israel and then the reference to the Egyptian firstborn that would be targeted for destruction if Pharaoh did in fact hurt God's firstborn. So then we have this interesting scenario with reference to the circumcision of the son of Moses. So notice in verse 24, it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. It's kind of an interesting juxtaposition or contrast. God is showing grace and kindness and provision to Moses. He is going sort of over and above telling Moses, you can go back to Egypt now, verse 19, those who are seeking your life are dead. So, so God has been abundant and profuse in terms of pouring out these things. And then we see that now he's sought to kill him. It's kind of reminiscent in Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus says, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus says, you are, 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 are blessed, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I mean, he pronounces him as blessed of God because he had this uh, uh, bit of information revealed to him. And then just dropping down in the context, uh, Peter tries to keep Jesus from going to Jerusalem to die. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. 
So there's this, this really quick flip that, that happens there, and the same sort of thing is indica indicated here. So on the way, at the encampment, that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son, probably Gershom, and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. So likely, Zipporah understood circumcision. The Midianites would have practiced it. It wasn't the case that it was simply confined to Israel. But Israel circumcised in a particular way, others did not. So Gershom may not have been fully circumcised, and perhaps that was what was in view. And I think what the longer or the sort of background is, is that the family as a whole needs to be prepared as Moses goes about the task of being the lawgiver to Israel. As the lawgiver to Israel, he himself has to toe the line and obey that law. And so this was a necessary element involved in terms of preparation before he goes to lead the children of Israel. Again, there's a lot written on this. I'm not sure that I understand most of it. All I know is that Zipporah basically saves the day because verse 26 says, so he let him go. Then she said, you are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. There may be overtones as well, or at least some background sort of substitutionary atonement relative to firstborn sons and that sort of thing. You'll see that, you know, in verse 23. If I, I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me, but if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. So there's this substitutionary blood atonement that some see as alluded to in here, and perhaps the, the circumcision ritual and the blood involved there at least indicates something of that as well. And then finally, we have the meeting of Moses and Aaron. So after this time of call and commission and Moses' preparation and God's word to Aaron, now we see their meeting. So verse 27, the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him on the mountain of God and kissed him. So Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. Exactly what we would expect. This is all preparatory so that when they go and face uh, Pharaoh, they're both singing off the same page. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then he did the signs in the sight of the people. So we have what God said coming to fruition. These are obedient servants. They're doing what they are called to do, and they're doing in the manner that God called them to do it. And so what we have in terms of a response, it will be short-lived. The children of Israel aren't always going to be believers. They're not always going to stand in awe of the living and true God, and they're not going to always worship him, and they're certainly not going to give great obedience to Moses every step of the way. But they, like us, know something of the ebb and flow of the Christian life. But in this instance, they respond favorably. Notice in verse 31, so the children or the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked on their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshiped. So this is a great response in light of the mercy of God. And I think for you and I, as we come into church, reflecting upon the mercy of God ought to be a great encouragement or provocation to us or instigation to worship and to praise and to glorify and honor him. His mercy is obvious in our salvation. His mercy is obvious in the cross work of the Lord Jesus, in the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus on behalf of his people. This is why theology is so important. We need to know who God is. We need to know what God does so that when we come into his presence, whether it be private, family, or corporate, with reference to church life, we worship him in a manner that is consistent with all that he has revealed himself to us to be. And I think that is a great way for this chapter to end with the children of Israel bowing their heads and worshiping. And just a couple quick thoughts and then we'll close. First, the reluctance of Moses. It demonstrates that he was a real man. You know, we might think that God would use angels to do his bidding, but he doesn't. God uses men and he uses earthen vessels so that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of man. You see that reluctance in Moses, his insignificance, 311, his realism, 41, what if the people don't believe or people don't uh, understand? And then the assessment of Moses, he's not eloquent, eloquent and he's not the right man for the job. And we might further say he didn't have his son circumcised. Why not? 
Was he afraid to offend his wife? Was he afraid to offend his father-in-law? That's what some of the commentators suggest, that he was you know, negligent at that level. But the text doesn't indicate. I've always found it difficult to make dogmatic statements with enigmatic passages, passages that aren't very specific, they're somewhat ambiguous, and somewhat difficult to, to, to determine or ascertain. I would say we ought to exercise caution with reference to making dogmatic statements that Moses didn't want to offend uh, Zipporah. I, I don't think that's probably in the ballpark. Secondly, the sovereignty of God. It's seen over rods and snakes, hands and leprosy, water and blood in the Nile. The sovereignty of God is seen over Moses and Aaron, Israel as a whole, and over Pharaoh and Egypt. In other words, what the psalmist said is absolutely correct. In Psalm 115, he says it again in Psalm 135, our God is in heaven, he does whatever he pleases. And that is obvious in the passage. The specific emphases are throughout this section, yea, to uh, uh, highlight who God is, not only for Israel, but also for Moses. He's going on this task, and it will be most important that God be there with him. Well, let's close in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your sovereignty, and we confess and see that it's absolute, it's comprehensive, it's over all things. And while some may scoff at such a notion, we rejoice in that, and we thank you. We know that you're sovereign over Justin Trudeau, over President Trump, over all the nations of the earth, all the leaders you make alive, you kill, you raise up the poor, you... You do all of these things according to Holy Scripture. And in this we greatly rejoice, and in this we find our comfort. I pray that you would encourage our hearts now and strengthen us with might. Help us to walk by faith and to realize that the God who has spoken in these things is to be trusted, a God to be worshipped, a God to be glorified. And as we have tasted of that grace and mercy in our own experience of the gospel, I pray that our Sunday worship would be marked by reverence and joy and with great zeal to worship our great God. I pray that would affect us in our homes as well with our private times before you and, and as families. And I pray for all of the families in this church. I pray for all of our children and our young people. God, may they see the reality that we, we love Christ, that we want to honor Christ and help us to, to preach Christ, help us to teach him to our children. And as well, God, help us to live in such a way that is consistent with that holy word. We ask that you would go with us now, keep us safe and be glorified in our lives. And we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.